Welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, where each time we meet, we run down the IT news of the week with a variable degree of snarkiness. I'm your host, Stephen Foskett, and joining me today is a special guest, my friend from Six Feet Up, Calvin Hendricks Parker. Welcome to the show, Calvin. Hey, Stephen. Great to be here. So today is National Smile Day, as everyone knows, but uh, Corey tells me that it's also National Megalodon Day. Hey, Corey, what's a megalodon? Well, Stephen, since you asked, it's an enormous fossil shark found in many seas during the Miocene and Pliocene epochs. So basically, it's a giant shark. A giant shark? Seems like they should have a Megalonado movie made after that. Well, I think they did make a mega turd movie called The Meg about right. that. But I actually paid good money to see that film, and I'm sorry I did. So <laughs> let's get into the news of the week, shall we? We should definitely do that, Stephen. At the IEEE annual VLSI symposium, Intel released a paper detailing their next generation of Intel 4 process nodes. After stalling at 10 nanometer, Intel is finally entering the EUV world with a competitive node for high-performance chips. But is Intel 4 really as great as it sounds? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So first of all, big, big pat on the back for Intel for moving forward. They have been stuck uh, at 10 nanometer for a long, long time. And they actually skipped EUV lithography for their 10 nanometer because they didn't really need it. Uh, unfortunately, that means that TSMC has a uh, sort of a corner on the market in terms of not just experience with EUV, but also the valuable equipment that's used to make that stuff. Well, now Intel's getting into EUV. Uh, Intel 4 is uh, promising all the benefits of a you know, four or five nanometer process node. Of course, those numbers are kind of archaic now because that's kind of not how things work anymore. So Personally, I'm not offended. I applaud Intel for switching to the just sort of four instead of four nanometer nomenclature because, you know, we kind of know what that is. Um, the cool thing is that this indeed does pack more transistors into the same amount of space. It uses EUV. Uh, everything's looking good. And we expect to see uh, Intel 4 process with x86 CPUs. The problem is that uh, Intel isn't using this for uh, high density uh, CPU components. For that, we're gonna wait for Intel 3. So we can kind of see Intel 4 as a tentative stepping stone into the world of EUV and into the next generation process node, but it's really Intel 3 that's gonna make the big difference. And we're gonna have to wait another year probably for that one to come out. So yes, it's great, Yes, it's kind of as great as it sounds, as long as it sounds like four nanometers, but uh, this isn't going to make as big of a difference until uh, Intel gets to Intel 3 and then their uh, third-party chip making uh, that comes with that. Yeah, I really look forward to that. I feel like it's nice to see Intel playing a little bit of catch up here and finally getting back in the game, but I look forward to Intel 3. Uh, now, that other x86 company hasn't been asleep at the wheel either and recently outlined their processor roadmap at a financial analyst day. AMD is moving forward with Zen 4 and Zen 5 from the data center server to the notebook, promising more performance and efficiency at every step. Plus, AMD is getting into chiplets and their next generation GPUs, and their Xilinx acquisition is paying off with an AI engine and the Ryzen processors. Are things going as well as they look for AMD? Absolutely. And uh, this is a really interesting story because you've got two companies now. Intel is finally getting back in gear, but AMD never, AMD never got out of gear. AMD has been doing a great job here in terms of their chip development. Uh, one of the things that Intel has long had over AMD, though, is, is accelerators, essentially things that aren't x86 CPU cores. So even though AMD had more and maybe even better x86 cores than Intel did, Intel had all sorts of special accelerated uh, instructions in the CPUs and also uh, offboard accelerators for storage and uh, network processing and AI and all sorts of other things. Well, one of the things that AMD got from their Xilinx acquisition was access to uh, IPU, DPU, AI accelerators, FPGAs, all that kind of stuff that Intel has had for a while. And they're starting to really put that into the Zen architecture. So we can look forward to that. Uh, AMD is also doing another thing that uh, Intel has been doing, which is chiplets. So we talked previously about the fact that Intel is going to be implementing uh, core-by-core chiplets in the future uh, x86 processor. 
Uh, AMD has kind of done that already with Ryzen. And now we're going to start seeing that on the uh, GPU side as well. Uh, AMD has long had uh, monolithic uh, GPUs where it's basically a single die, a single chip uh, that goes into their uh, Instinct or uh, Radeon GPUs. Well, now we're going to start having chiplets in there. We're going to start seeing uh, other things like the Xilinx uh, AI engine maybe on that side as well. And of course, AMD is giving us a great roadmap here for Zen 4, which is coming real soon now at 5 nanometers, uh, including a vCache version of that, which is their extended cache technology, along with Zen 5 on the horizon at 4 or 3 nanometers, depending on when uh, TSMC can give them some fab time. Now, that last bit, I think, is the important takeaway, though. Even though AMD is really rocketing forward here with their development, all of it is dependent on TSMC and other global foundries and others being able to make these chips. And right now, uh, that's kind of a sore spot since we could see a future where AMD might not be able to deliver these things on time simply because the fabs can't do it for them. Whether that means that AMD starts uh, outsourcing things maybe to Samsung, gosh, maybe even to Intel, uh, that would be a real interesting future to see. But uh, that being said, AMD is doing a real good job, and they are really attacking Intel everywhere from the server to the cloud to the desktop. Yeah, no, I've heard really good things about these new chips. So moving on here, uh, let's talk Cloudflare. Uh, they just reported the second largest DDoS attack on record. They weathered a massive 26 million requests per second. Not only this, was this a withering attack, but it utilized HTTPS, which is much more compute intensive than a plain text attack costing the company and the attacker more resources. Is this a sign of things to come? I mean, I think it is. If you've got uh, the ability for, you know, some attacker, a small operation. You know, what was interesting on this attack is specifically that it was HTTPS, but it was also done on a relatively small botnet. Uh, I think there was like just over 5,000 devices that were part of this botnet that generated, what was it like in 30 seconds, it generated 212 million HTTP requests over you know 1,500 networks, 121 countries. I mean, this is really super widespread. I think that there's going to be have to be uh, more done in the future to probably address the proliferation of these botnets. But they've been around since basically the dawn of of computing time and anything that was connected to a, a network anywhere. Uh, but that what was great was Cloudflare's response to it. I mean, within you know moments of automatically detecting uh, the fact that there was an attack uh, ongoing, they were able to mitigate that. Now that was also expensive for them to do. So I don't know how they're going to pass those kinds of costs along to the consumers to be able to continue to thwart you know, botnet uh, attacks of of this scale wreaking havoc on their networks. Um, it's just. I mean, it's kind of crazy out there when you think about the number of machines that have vulnerabilities that are unprotected or sitting on a network and people's home internets are only getting faster. I mean, I know I've got a, a gigabit up and down. That's only facilitating if there was an infected machine on any machine or IoT device on any machine in my network in my home, I'm now susceptible to really amplifying uh, these kinds of attacks. Uh, I think we're gonna have to help you know, groups like Cloudflare. I think they, they have their tagline, it's like help build a better internet. And I think that that is a, a very noble cause and uh, uh, anything we can do to help them help build a better internet is what we got to go after. Uh, that's, it's just intense, the, the kinds of attacks we're seeing. The annual Cisco Live event is taking place in Las Vegas this week. And Cisco's biggest news was the further investigation of their in, integration of their Meraki network management suite with the traditional Catalyst line of data center gear. We've been watching Meraki since it was a separate company and it has really become an important part of Cisco since their 2012 acquisition. Does this announcement mean that Meraki is taking over Cisco or is something else at work there? Yeah, this is a great uh, sign of things uh, that are happening at Cisco. Uh, one of the challenges for any company is to basically move into the future. Uh, if you're Cisco and you basically dominate the data center, uh, what do you do for your next act? Well, it's hard to develop uh, the next generation product in-house. And uh, a lot of the time, companies will buy a young, a scrappy startup with a new idea and try to integrate that. But that's often a failure, as you are well aware. A lot of the time, those uh, new startup uh, products end up getting axed a few years later. That's not what's happening with Meraki. So what Meraki has given Cisco is a cloud management 
platform for networking gear. And it's really good. In fact, we used it here at the Gestalt IT offices for a long time, and it works great. It's uh, definitely up to the task of uh, what you see from competitors. Uh, until now, though, that has been out of reach for buyers of traditional Cisco networking gear, like the Catalyst uh, access points and network switches. Well, guess what? Uh, Meraki's coming to Catalyst. Uh, essentially, uh, what they've announced at Cisco Live is that they can uh, basically uh, re-personality Catalyst gear to work with Meraki uh, management. And if a company wants to uh, go with a cloud-managed solution, they can, they can do that now even with the Catalyst line. That's really, really good news. And it's also good news because it gives some flexibility to go the other way as well. So uh, companies can grow either in the direction of cloud management or on-premises management. Um, and I think that that's good news all around for Cisco, Cisco customers and also, frankly, for Cisco itself because it shows that they've done a nice job of integrating this acquisition. Uh, some of the other things that Cisco's talking about at Cisco Live, by the way, are... Um, the Nexus Cloud, which is an insight, intersight-based SaaS uh, for cloud management of uh, networking, and uh, more work with Thousand Eyes, which is another acqu acquisition that we really enjoyed uh, before and after Cisco's uh, purchase. Uh, Thousand Eyes is going to be available in Cisco's SD-WAN customers. Uh, so I think this is all good news, and I'm glad Cisco's doing it. I think it shows a level of maturity when they realize that you know they've kind of hit the top of the hardware game this is all about software now and how people manage those networks. All right, in other news, data protection company Haiku has secured another 53 million in funding just a year after raising an over 87 million. Sure, data protection is hot right now, but what is Haiku going to do with all this cash? Yeah, this is uh, pretty, pretty surprising. Um, Haiku actually admitted to our good friend, Chris Evans, that this uh, new fundraising round was uh, because companies approached them wanting to give them money rather than because they were out there shopping for more money. Effectively, Haiku, you may not have heard of them because they're not quite as high profile as some of the flashy uh, companies in the data protection industry, but they're doing the work. Uh, they've presented at Field Day before, and if you want to see what they're doing, just go to the Tech Field Day website, look up HYCU. But effectively, they uh, have produced a really solid data protection and data management product, and it's getting a lot of uh, interest, especially from OEMs. Now, Haiku, like a lot of other companies, is moving into SaaS data protection, so essentially protecting things like Salesforce data and uh, Office 365 and things like that. Um, those, uh, that's important because those are the people that are investing. So effectively, the companies that came to Cisco or to Haiku were Cisco and Atlassian. Well, we just talked about how Cisco was uh, getting into more SaaS and, and uh, Atlassian, of course, is all about SaaS uh, with Jira, Trello and all those kind of things. And that's really where Haiku is going next. So all I'm going to say here is watch this space. We have a company that's got a proven track record of uh, developing really innovative and interesting software. And now they've got tons of money and connections with Cisco and Atlassian. Um, Haiku is on the rise. Yeah. I mean, I think for anyone to be looking to hand out money right now in this current environment, uh, that must mean or speak volumes to what they got going on. All uh, right, Stephen, I think it's time we take a closer look. Uh, we've got a couple articles here we're going to dive a little deeper on. Uh, let's kick it off with Pure Storage. Uh, there's been so many events this week. We just talked about Cisco Live and all the uh, other conferences that are going on. But Pure Storage held their annual Accelerate event in Los Angeles last week. And the key new introduction was the next generation of their Flash Blade scale-out storage solution. They claim it is disaggregated because CPU and storage can be mixed and matched, and that scales out to past a petabyte. Pure also went GA with the Portworx data services, which brings the company into the market for a database as a service. What does this mean for unstructured data in the enterprises? Yeah, Pure is a, another company that's really impressing everyone. Um, you know, the storage market may not be all that flashy, but ask any analyst and they'll tell you that storage is where the money is. And that's where Pure is too. <laughs> so uh, Pure is, uh, Accelerate was a wonderful event. Uh, I Full disclosure, they flew me to Los Angeles and hosted me to come to their event. Um, it was a great event. It was a great opportunity for me to talk to the folks at Pure and to learn a lot more from everybody involved. So I spent uh, hours with the Flashblade team digging into the Flashblade S. And uh, 
I think it's safe to say that uh, whether you want to call it disaggregated or not, the Flashblade S is a really solid new option for pure customers and even not pure customers. Essentially, uh, just like NetApp took the file server and turned it into a storage array, Pure has taken that whole concept of unstructured data and married it with scale out and all flash and built uh, something really, really special. The new Flashblade S actually uses the same disk modules as their Flash Array software, which allows customers to mix and match. It also, uh, because the drives are no longer uh, coupled tightly with the CPU, it means that the drives can get bigger and bigger and bigger without having to replace the entire blade, which includes CPU and memory, and vice versa. So it gives customers a lot more flexibility. It means that the thing has a much broader accessible market. And what an accessible market it is. I mean, the thing scales uh, past two petabytes now in, uh, in one chassis and, and can, can scale all the way down to just uh, you know, a few hundred terabytes in, in terms of capacity. So pretty much any company that needed a uh, file server, a high performance object or a uh, file server could uh, buy a Flash ba- Flashblade S and then they could grow the thing, thanks to Pure's evergreen approach, they can grow the thing seamlessly for probably a decade to come. So it's a really great product. Um, really, really impressed with what they've done with the Flashblade. And I just hope that Pure can uh, get out there and show the world this, this new system. Yeah, I think it's really exciting what Pure is doing for the edge and then on-premises data center computing and then being able to give people that longevity. I also think it's innovative what they have done by offering the Portworks uh, suite of services. It is more than just a hardware play anymore or a pure, pure storage. They have got a whole suite of tools now around managing Kubernetes, backup as a service, their Portworks enterprise, you know, offering this managed environment for being able to take this and not only do it on you know, the pure storage uh, specific hardware, but the announcement of the Portworks data services was actually really interesting to me as a developer that they now offer a solution for me to be able to spin up and run database as a service, basically. They've got a selection of you know seven or eight curated uh, database options, and it manages all the, the day two operations. It's all the patching. It's all the upgrades. It's basically the kind of point and click uh, cloud native uh, experience you've come to expect from the public cloud providers like a, you know, AWS or an Azure or GCP, but now they can do that in a uh, on-premises at the edge in the cloud uh, with the same APIs. So now I've got the the same experience no matter where I'm at, and that experience actually translates down to even my local desktop. So as a developer, I can now be developing on my internal corporate application but running that deployment against the exact same database, you know, whether it's Postgres, Redis, Kafka, Cassandra, those are all supported now by their database as a service. And as far as I know, this is kind of a, a, a novel uh, product. This is one of the first of its kind for managed database as a service on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, just taking that, their commitment to Kubernetes and compute and software uh, to that next level. And I think if you combined it with their you know, Flashblade announcement, that direct, uh, they've got a direct access announcement they made in Portworx Enterprise that just would accelerate the speed of some of these tools uh, just you know, to the moon. So I'm pretty excited about the software aspect of where Pure Storage is going uh, through their Portworx acquisition. Yeah, I agree. And I think that the key thing about Portworx data services that excites me is that essentially this is an entirely new market for any storage company. And it really kind of matches what, uh, like I said, what NetApp did uh, with bringing file servers into the world of storage arrays. Now we're starting to see databases become something in the world of storage arrays. Essentially companies saying, you know, databases, database is just a service that we provide internally. So why don't we let uh, professionals handle that instead of having a whole team of of DBAs that are trying to keep these things up and running, especially for those uh, edge databases like Mongo and Redis, et cetera. So I really like what they're doing here. um, And I really think that this uh, potentially opens up a whole new market for Pure. Calvin, uh, we've had a lot of talk recently about passwords and security and all the two-factor authentication, all those sort of things. Well, uh, Apple is trying to kill the password, apparently. Uh, In iOS 16, in the new macOS Ventura, Apple uh, is going to include a feature called PassKey that is poised to replace the way that you log into sites across the internet. Uh, This is not the first time an enterprise has made this company, but this is a big alliance that goes well beyond Apple. Uh, what's different this time around? 
Yeah, I think if you all remember from last year, Microsoft made the big announcement that they're going to go password free uh, for all their uh, logins and applications. And I think it's had some amount of uptake, but I think what's key with the Apple announcement this time is how easy this is probably going to be for end users. I, I know as a person who has like YubiKeys for doing second factor with hardware, these are super geeky tools. Like there's the normal humans just don't think about pulling out their keychain and using NFC or plugging in a USB device to get that second factor authentication. But those same standards that are in those YubiKey devices, for example, you know, the FIDO Alliance has the WebAuthn uh, standard for doing this kind of second factor or primary factor authentication are really what's going to kick in here with Apple's Passkey product. It's really exciting that they're working with those industry standards to basically make it so that if I've got my phone with me and I can use FaceTime or uh, Touch ID, I can log into any site using this passkey technology, which really under the covers is using a, a standard security technique from a, a large industry organization. Again, that ease of use is what you come to expect from a company like Apple. So being able to do that from my iPhone, from my Apple Watch, from a MacBook Pro or, or whatever device I'm on, I think the reason this has a chance for success is the fact that Apple has a, a good penetration into the mobile market. Uh, now, I don't know what you're going to do if you're on an, an Android device, but if you are fully all in on Apple devices or even partially in on Apple devices, you're going to be able to pick up your iPhone and face ID when you're trying to log into a website and be right on in. Uh, it, just, it really reduces that risk of passwords being exposed. Uh, another thing you might have been worried about is if you know where do these passwords or pass keys get stored? You know, Apple will synchronize them, but they will not store them on their iCloud devices. Uh, I think a key feature here is those keys are only stored on your devices and never stored in Apple's cloud. Now, uh, it leads you to a, a question like, what happens if I lose all my devices? I know, Stephen, you, you said you saw an article about uh, maybe if your house burned down and all your devices were inside it, how do you get into your sites now? Exactly. And uh, I'll point out, I'm going to include the article that brought this up, a thought experiment by Terrence Eden in the show notes. But essentially, if your house burns down, what do you do? Since, as you say, all these pass keys are synchronized across all your devices, but they're synchronized securely. And if you lose, well, all your devices, then how do you get into things anymore? Well, uh, Apple does have a support article that talks about this and um, talks about how you can recover your keychain. The bottom line is that it is possible. And the first step would be uh, basically recovering your phone number. Now, those of you who watch the uh, rundown regularly or follow the tech news run regularly understand the tone in my voice when I say that because SIM attacks are actually a thing that people are using to break into people's stuff. And uh, basically, and that's why uh, two-factor authentication using a text message to a phone number is all, not as secure as people think it is. And effectively, that's kind of what is going to be required. Essentially, if you lose all your devices and your uh, friendly neighborhood uh, backup person uh, who uh, is also uh, can recover your account also loses all their devices, like let's say you two were home together and the house burned down, well, then what are you going to do next? And the answer is, well, you can call Apple. Apple will have to verify your account and they can get you back into iCloud and iCloud Keychain and recover the passcodes theoretically. But in practice, um, I think that might be a bad uh, situation. So I don't know, maybe you keep an extra device uh, somewhere else that's synchronized to your iCloud account. That would probably be helpful. Another thing that you could think about is uh, some kind of escrow um, or exporting some of this stuff. I don't know. But uh, at the bottom, at the end of the day, uh, there's always going to be the opportunity because Apple can recover your account with SMS and phone numbers. There's always going to be the possibility of social engineering. And in the passcode world, social engineering could open up literally every account and not just the accounts uh, that you happen to have a password stolen from, that sort of thing. So uh, pass keys sound great. I really like the idea. I really am a supporter of this. I'm a supporter of the FIDO Alliance and what they're doing because passwords just ain't working. And um, even the two-factor auth that uh, companies use ain't working either. Uh, one of my big pet peeves is when I set up Authenticator two-factor codes and it says, oh, well, we can just send you an SMS or an email instead. I mean, it's like, no, that's why I set it up this way because I don't want you to do that. 
anyway, the point is, uh, this is not uh, perfect, uh, but let's not let perfect be the enemy of good. Yeah, I would love to see them collaborate with like a YubiKey for some kind of an offline cold storage for pass keys. So maybe you synchronize it you know, once a month or every so often and keep it in the fireproof safe. Uh, but how often are you going to be someplace where if, it, if a fire breaks out in your house, you're not grabbing your phone to call 911 and run outside? You got your phone. Uh, this, that, it definitely seems like a pretty theoretical uh, situation. Yeah. Well, for me, I'm a big believer in Tracer and uh, devices yeah. like that. So maybe they can help. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm on the ledger bandwagon. So I'm with you. So uh, thanks for that uh, rundown of the news, Calvin. But let's look at the week ahead. Um, uh, there's a few events going on. As we mentioned, Cisco Live US is happening, including Tech Field A Extra. And here's a hint. That's where your co-host, uh, Tom Hollingsworth, is. And that's why he's not with us uh, today. Uh, but we've got a few more events. Calvin, you want to go through a couple of these? Uh, sure. It sounds like HashiConf is uh, coming to Europe uh, June 20th through the 22nd. So they make an amazing suite of tools. I wish I could actually had enough time in the universe that I could go to all these great conferences. But HashiConf would definitely be one I'd want to make. Uh, it sounds like Cloud Field Day is coming up. Uh, I am sad I won't make that one. I know I was invited, but I couldn't go. That's June 22nd through June 24th. Uh, it sounds like a great lineup of companies are going to be a part of that event as well. We've also got uh, HPE Discover coming up June 28th through 30th. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make that one either, but uh, shout out to my friends over at HPE. I'll be watching. And finally, Mobility Field Day is coming up in July, the 13th through the 15th. So if you're a Tom Hollingsworth fan or if you're into Wi-Fi and mobility, uh, check that one out as well. Uh, Stephen, we need to clone ourselves so we can go to all these events and be someplace else simultaneously. Absolutely. I wish I could. Honestly, I love these events. And has to Amsterdam. <laughs> so uh, thanks uh, for listening to the rundown. Um, actually, a special call out to some of the folks who approached me at Pure Accelerate and said that they listen to the rundown each week. Hi, guys. Uh, also, Tom ran into our friend C Craig Waters and said that he listens to the rundown all the time and listens every week. So, Craig, thank you for joining us. And if you're listening to The Rundown and enjoying it, please do give a shout out. Uh, I'm at S. Foskett. That's Calvin HP. And you can also find Networking Nerd. We would love to hear from you. Uh, just let us know that you're listening. It's, it's cool to have that. So remember, the Gestalt IT Rundown is available as a podcast as well as uh, on YouTube every Wednesday uh, uh, at Gestalt IT Video on YouTube or in your favorite podcast applications. You can also uh, find the videos posted on our Facebook page, uh, Facebook slash Gestalt IT, as well as our LinkedIn page. And Tom will be back next Wednesday with another special guest to deliver all the IT news of the week that was, since I'm going to be hosting Cloud Field Day, as Calvin mentioned. Until then, for myself, for Calvin Hendricks-Parker, and all of us at the Gestalt IT family, thanks for joining, and here's wishing you and yours a fantastic and smiley Megalon yeah. Day. Don't forget to smile. <laughs>